It's one o'clock, it's one o'clock in the morning, and it's about A.D. 32, and all of us, we're inside a courtyard, we're inside a courtyard of a kind of a palatial house that's there in Jerusalem. It's the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. It's also the home of Annas, his father-in-law, and all of Annas' sons and family. It's kind of cold because it's a, a cold desert Jerusalem night. And so we're all gathered by a fireplace there in the center courtyard where they would have those fires. And as we're there, we hear that there's a commotion in the corridor by the gate at the opening where the entrance is. And the gatekeeper is letting a mob full of people into the place. And so our attention is drawn. There's all sorts of people, but it's interspersed with temple guards and Roman soldiers. And they have somebody with them, and he's restrained, and he's obviously been roughed up. It's Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, the prophet and the miracle worker, the one who claims that he's the Son of God and the Messiah. And what they're going to do is they're going to take him through that courtyard, and they're going to take him up some steps into the chambers where Annas, who used to be the high priest, is located. And you say, well, I thought Caiaphas was a high priest. If somebody's going to interrogate him, shouldn't it be Caiaphas? But you see, Annas is his father-in-law, and Annas was the power broker. He was the godfather of the Jewish religious situation in Jerusalem. In fact, when Annas' term was up, it was handed down to his son, and then his next son, and then his next son, and finally down to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So Jesus is brought up there. And as Jesus goes into the headquarters where Annas is, all of a sudden our attention is drawn to something that's back behind, far behind the mob that came in. There's somebody who's kind of moving in and out of the shadows. And we finally, when he gets close enough, we realize it's Peter. It's one of the ones that Jesus called as an apostle, someone who would represent him, who would be the foundation of his teaching and his faith when he was gone. It was a great honor. And it wasn't that long ago, not long ago at all, in a garden called Gethsemane where Jesus often went with his disciples so he could pray that Peter was there with the other disciples, the other apostles, and earlier in the night, Peter had boasted Jesus. He says, Lord, I will never leave you. I will never desert you, ever. But when they were there in that garden and Jesus was praying with such agony, all of a sudden, over a thousand people showed up with knives and guns. Guns, right, in those days. No, just with staves and swords. They came to arrest Jesus. And Peter, remembering what he had said, he drew a sword, which was probably more like a fishing implement than a true sword. And he went for the person that was closest to him with a sword. And it just so happened that, that person was Malchus, who was the servant of the high priest. And Peter, being the swordsman that he was, aiming for the head, cut off his ear. And then Peter and all of the rest of the apostles ran. They did the very thing that Peter promised he would never do. They deserted Jesus. And now Jesus has been led up. And Peter is following far behind in the shadows. He's far behind. Okay, well, I can see that that's not working this morning either. Okay. So there's supposed to be more slides on there. I'll just talk it through. That's fine. 
So Peter comes to the entrance, but he can't get into the entrance because he's not known and his family is not known by the high priest. But luckily for Peter, his buddy John, who also was called as an apostle, his buddy John comes along and John and his family is known by the high priest. And so John gains entrance for Peter. Peter comes in, tries to meld in so that nobody will notice him, but he, he feels guilty that he deserted Jesus and he wants to see how this is going to play out. But he's cold, so he makes his way finally over to the fire and starts to warm himself. And while he's there, one of the maids that's there, one of the servants begins to look at him intently and finally, she says, you, you're one of his. You're one of his disciples. And Peter says, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know this man. He denies Jesus. Now, I'm sure Peter is taken by surprise here. And normally when Satan comes at us, he comes at us in terms that we're not ready for. And it's kind of a surprise. And he declares, I've never seen this man before. Now, we know that the scripture tells us that Peter denied Jesus three times. And we might think that this happened in quick succession, but the truth of the matter was it was spread out over two hours. Jesus was up in that chamber being interrogated for two hours. That's what Scripture tells us. And so it also says that when Peter denied him the first time, he ran from that situation, probably into the corridor leading out to the entrance. And we don't know the next time that somebody came to him. It could have been a half an hour. It could have been 45 minutes. It could have been an hour. We don't know. But sometime within that two-hour span, another person came up and said, no, surely you're one of his disciples. And now this is not a shock anymore. Peter's had time to think about this. Now it's not a shock. Now he's formulated in his mind that he's going to save himself from imprisonment or suffering, punishment, maybe death. And so he says, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Never seen the dude in my life. And now an hour goes by. And Peter's made his way back to the fire because he's cold. And it just so happens that a relative of Malchus, the guy whose ear he cut off, happens to be by that fire. And he looks at him and he says, no, surely you are one of those. I can tell by your Galilean accent. It's thick. And now Peter gets emphatic. And he starts to call a curse down on himself. A curse in the night. I swear by the name of God. In fact, may God strike me dead. I have no idea what you're talking about. And two things happen in quick succession once he does that. One of them is, is that the cock crows for the second time, which is exactly what Jesus prophesied would happen. Exactly. Jesus says, before the cock can crow twice, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. Peter goes, oh, no, no, Lord, I wouldn't do that. No. So now Peter knows it's exactly who Jesus said he was. He's a prophet. He's the Messiah. I have denied publicly Messiah. The second thing that happens is even more terrifying for Peter. The Bible tells us that at that point in time, he locks eyes with Jesus. So evidently, Jesus was being led down the steps. They had been through interrogating him. They were going to bring him out now and bring him to the Romans so he could be executed. And at that exact time when Peter is denying and calling down a curse, evidently Jesus coming down the steps, Peter turns around and their eyes lock. Now, you need to understand what Jesus must have looked like in this situation. First of all, he'd been in a garden with such agony in his prayer that he was sweating drops of blood. He'd been through great trauma. Not only that, but the scripture tells us that when he was up in the room being interrogated, by the way, the whole interrogation was totally illegal according to Jewish law. You couldn't interrogate somebody. You couldn't judge them at night. And not only that, but they didn't just ask him questions. They took turns punching him in the face and spitting on him. So that's what Peter would have seen when he locked eyes with Jesus. You can imagine how Peter must have felt. And it says that Peter ran away 
and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. So Peter was in his dark room. And that's what we've been talking about over these last couple of weeks. We've been talking about being in a dark room and how God, even in that dark room, works things in us which are necessary. Faith, strength, and thanksgiving. It's kind of like the worship team was in a dark room this morning. I was in my own dark room. And so, when we think about this and we think about Peter, we've got to ask ourselves a question. The question would be this. How could this man, after all he had seen and experienced, deny his Savior? I mean, think about it. Jesus specifically came to him and picked him, not just to be a disciple, but to be an apostle, one through whom the Scripture would come, one through whom the foundation of the church would be laid. In fact, he was a leader amongst the apostles. Jesus had walked, uh, Peter had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He had seen Jesus' miracles. He'd seen him raise the dead and calm the sea and multiply the bread and cast out demons. And not just that, but Jesus had sent them out two by two and he said, I'm giving you authority to cast out demons, to heal people, to do miracles. So Peter, when he went out, he must have experienced the power of God as by the power of God he cast out demons and he healed people. How could he possibly ever come to a point where he would deny his Lord? But you know what? I think if we were honest, maybe it's not that hard to relate to Peter. Not as dramatic as Peter. Maybe our lives weren't being threatened. But how many times have we, how many times have we been in a situation in the public where we should have associated with Jesus, we should have proclaimed who we were and that Jesus was our Lord and that Jesus was Lord and instead, we didn't. So what I want to talk about this morning is a couple of different things. This morning, I want to talk about the cause for going into that particular dark room and maybe how we can avoid it. But also, I want to talk about the comfort that's in that dark room. So let's talk about the cause. What was the cause that brought Peter to that place, that horrible place? Earlier in the night, before Peter's denial, before going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had gathered in what we now refer to as the upper room. Jesus had gathered there with his 12 apostles, Jesus knowing full well what was awaiting him. And they were celebrating the Jewish Passover. There were a lot of things that were said in that room, a lot of things. But one of the things that must have shocked them to their core was Jesus says, I need to let you know, guys, one of you tonight is going to betray me. And I'm sure that that just boggled their minds because, I mean, Lord, we've left everything. We've followed you for three and a half years. How could any of these guys, see, having seen what you've done, having heard what you, how could we betray you? But we know because we have the scripture that Judas Iscariot betrayed him. So Judas went out. And Jesus had just prophesied to them, you are going to betray me. You're going to leave me. You're going to desert me. And Peter goes, oh, not me, Lord. Maybe the rest of these riahus, but not me. And they all said, no, no, Lord, we won't do it. And then they left that place and they went towards Gethsemane, towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they were walking, Jesus reiterates the prophecy. I want to let you know, you're going to betray, you're all going to desert me tonight. And they all said, no, 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 Lord, we would never do that. And Peter goes, Lord, I would go to jail with you. I would rather die. And then they came to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said to eight of them, you guys remember Judas is gone now. He said to eight of them, you stay here. And he took Peter, James, and John, and he went a little ways, and he said to them, guys, I desperately need your help tonight. Would you stay here and pray 
with me. And he went a little ways and he fell. And it, it's impossible for us to understand what was the pressure that was on him. The, the human part of him, because Jesus was fully human and fully God, the human part of him was thinking about the torture that was about to happen to him. The excruciating torture, that, the, like the worst way to die you can possibly imagine. He knew he was going to the cross. The God part of him was thinking about the fact that for the first time in all of eternity, his communion with the Father was going to be broken. Because all of the sins of all of mankind which ever lived would be put on him on the cross. And so he's in excruciating pain. He's praying so much so that, and the doctors say that this is actually possible, that there was blood coming out of his sweat. And he comes back to these three guys, and they're not praying, they're asleep. And he says to them, guys, really? You couldn't pray with me for just a little while? And he says something very important. He says, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. You need to pray so that you do not fall. So, so here's two things that Jesus has done for us. He's warned us ahead of time that in and of ourselves, we do not have the strength to walk the Christian walk. And he's given us a cure. He says, pray. Seek the Father. Seek the Father's strength. Seek the Father's protection. Seek the Father's guidance. And they neglected it. All of them neglected it. Not just Peter. Ah, but this is what I want to end on. I want to end on the fact that there's comfort in the dark room. There's comfort in the dark room. Read this out loud with me, would you? Here we go. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. Jesus says, you're going to desert me. Peter goes, Lord, I'll go to prison with you. I would die. Last thing I would ever do is desert you or betray you. And this is when Jesus says, Simon, Simon. Does this sound familiar, you Bible scholars? Anything sound familiar in here? How many of you have ever read the book of Job? How many of you ever lived the life of Job? <laughs> How many of you lived the life of Job this week? <laughs> when you're trying to play music? <laughs> it's exactly what happened in the Old Testament. There was this man named Job. And one day it says, Satan came before God in the presence of God with all the other angels. And God says, have you noticed my servant Job? He's a faithful man. He, he won't turn away from me. Satan goes, well, sure, because you bless him, take it away, and he'll curse you to your face. And so God's, basically Satan's going, I want to sift him like wheat. I want to throw him up in the air and let the chaff go away and see if anything comes down. It's exactly what happened here. Satan came to Jesus and said, I want to sift. Now, interestingly enough, some of your translations will say, Satan has asked permission to sift you. And so you go, it must have just been talking about Peter. But in the Greek, the you there is all of them. It's, it's like the southern translation, all y'all. I want to sift all y'all, right? A couple things that are important here. Satan doesn't bother to sift people that aren't dangerous to him. So if you're following after Jesus, more than likely it'll happen sometime in our life. So it's important for us to understand the dynamics which are going on here. The other thing that we can see here is that he had to get permission from Jesus. Thank God. Jesus says that we are in his hands and he's in the Father's hands. So nothing comes into our lives unless God allows it to come into our lives. And God tells us this wonderful truth. He causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Jesus is warning Peter. Peter, I want to let you know what's going down. I want, you, I want to let you know what's happening. You can't see it, but I can. But Peter's response is kind of like this. Hey, I know you're the Messiah and you know a lot of stuff, but you got this one wrong. You got this one wrong, Jesus. You don't understand. All of my life, I've been the dude. 
I've been strong. Nobody bothers me. Nobody fights with me. I'm the best fisherman. I'm the best this, the best that. I've got it under control. We're good. I am not going to leave you. And I want you to notice something too. I want you to notice the target of Satan. It's not just that we sin. He's after something very specific. He's after our faith. Jesus says, I'm going to pray that your faith doesn't fail. See, it's one thing for us to, to sin. It's one thing for us to struggle. It's even one thing for us publicly to deny Jesus. But what Satan really wants is that we come to a point where we don't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. They don't, we don't believe there's a God and we don't believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And maybe some of you in here have come to that point. And I want to, I want to encourage you. I understand. Hard things happen in this life. Hard things happen. We go to college and a lot of the professors there try and wipe away our mind and, and tell us all sorts of things that are supposed to erase our faith. We struggle with things. We struggle with things. And sometimes we come to pastors or we come to parents. We ask serious questions and they give us Sunday school answers and we go, this must not be real. But if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we've surrendered our hearts to Him, there's something really wonderful that we need to see. And that is, in that dark room, in that darkest of places, God doesn't desert us. In fact, Jesus intercedes for us and prays for us that our faith will not fail. Jesus intercedes for us that our faith will not fail. Isn't that interesting? I have a question. When Jesus prays, do you think the Father hears? Yeah, probably. Probably goes something like this. Hey, Dad. Yes, son. Keith is screwing up again. He's really messing up. He's in a dark room. So, Father, can you make sure that his faith doesn't fail? Why would I do that, Jesus? Well, Dad, because he surrendered his life to me, trusted me as Savior, and now he's one of your adopted kids. God the Father says, done deal. Make it happen, son. Anything you want, Jesus. If he's yours, he's mine. I'll make sure that no matter how beat up and banged up Keith is, I'll make sure his faith doesn't fail. It's a wonderful thing to know Jesus is praying for us. Let's read this out loud. Here we go. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. The writer of the letter of Hebrews tells us the, the present day ministry of Jesus Christ. He is our high priest, interceding for us in all ways. But it gets even better. He doesn't just intercede for us. He restores us. Jesus restores us. There we go. Nothing's working this morning. So Jesus had risen from the dead and he had appeared to the apostles a couple of three times. I suspect when he appeared to the apostles a couple of three times, he didn't speak specifically to Peter. But there was going to come a time when he did. So they've all seen the risen Lord. And in the Gospel of John, it says that Peter said to seven of the, of the fishermen, of the apostles, he said, hey guys, let's go fishing. Because Peter figured he was useless to God, worthless. He denied God publicly. It was disgraced. And he's like, one thing I know I can do, I can fish. So come on guys, let's go fishing. And it wasn't sport fishing, because they fished all night. Okay, this is not sport fishing. They were serious. Peter's going... I may not be able to follow Jesus. I may have denied him. I can't be an apostle, but I can fish. So come on, guys, let's go. And because Peter is a leader, they go, yeah, let's go. And off they go. And they fish all night long. And the first thing that happens is that Jesus sets up some scenarios where he's going he's to recreate some situations to help Peter. And the first situation that he recreates 
is when Peter was called initially by Jesus. How many of us remember, if you've read the account, the guys were fishing, Peter and his buddies were fishing. They'd fished all night. They hadn't caught anything. Jesus is there on the shore. Peter comes in. He's cleaning his nets. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, let's, let's cast out and go fishing. And Peter's like, Lord, I'm the fisherman. You're the Messiah. I know how to fish. Been out there all night. Nothing's happening. But if you say so, I'll do it. Peter goes out. And Jesus says, throw it over this side. He throws it over that side. There's so many fish you can hardly haul it in. Okay, that happened in the past. That was three and a half years ago. But Jesus is going to recreate that. So now they're out fishing all night long. They catch nothing. How many of you have ever fished all night long? How many of you have ever caught nothing? Oh, a lot more hands should go up. Come on. I caught a fish this long. Yeah. Um, and as the sun comes up from the boat, they see somebody on the shoreline. And he says, hey, how's it going out there, guys? How'd you do? Struck out. And the person on the shore says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And guess what? So many fish, they can hardly get it up. He recreates the very time and the place where he called Peter in the first place. And one of the guys on the boat goes, duh, it's the Lord. And Peter, even though they're close to shore, he jumps in and swims. If he would have paddled with the boat, they probably would have gotten there just as quickly, but that's Peter. And as they come to the shore, they see that there's a fire that's burning. So he's recreated the situation where he called Peter. And now he's going to recreate the situation where Peter fell where Peter went into his dark room, where Peter denied the Lord. Because the Scripture very specifically says it's not just any fire, it's a charcoal fire. Do you know, throughout all of Scripture, Old and New Testament, there's all sorts of mentions of fire. You would expect that. They didn't have the stoves and things we do nowadays. They would build fires. But there's only two times where it specifies a charcoal fire. You know where they are? One here, where Jesus is cooking the fish when they come on the shore, and the fire that was burning a charcoal fire the night that Peter denied Jesus at Caiaphas' house. And so everything, the sights, the sounds, the smells, Jesus is going to do some surgery on Peter right now. And he does the same thing with us if we'll let him do it. Some of us have walked away from the Lord. Some of us have failed miserably. Most all of us have probably. I know I have. There have been times in the ministry, I, I kid you not, where I just felt like I should just go to my wife and say, I'm just going to go resign. I screwed up so bad. I'm just going to give him my resignation. I shouldn't be in this pulpit. I shouldn't be a pastor. And I wish she wouldn't have said, you know, you're right. No, she didn't do that. But, <laughs> but. And, and as this charcoal fire is burning... Jesus pulls Peter aside. He says, Peter, let's talk. And, and there's this famous conversation that goes on, and some of you have read this before. Some of you have maybe have been taught this. But Jeter, Jesus pulls Peter aside, and he says, Peter, do you love me? Now, in the Greek, it gives us a, a much better understanding of what's going on in the conversation because Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you highest form of love? Do you love me with the highest form of the love which is not asking anything in return, the love which wants the best for me? Even if you don't want the best for me, I want the best for you. He says, you agape me, Peter, and Peter is at least honest enough because here he is, he's just grabbed these guys away and said, now nah, forget that apostle stuff. Let's go fishing. And so he's honest enough to go, Lord, you know I phileo you. I have a brotherly love. I have a, a warm affection for you. He, he knows he can't say agape. He knows that's not true. And Jesus says, well, feed my sheep. And then Jesus asks him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter goes, well, Lord, you, you know I phileo you. In fact, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you agape more, all, more than all of these? And there's some uh, disagreement as what he meant by all of these. Was he, was he pointing to the apostles 
Or was he pointing to the fishing net and the fishing boat? You love me more than this, Peter? Or these guys? Peter goes, well, you know I, you know I phileo you, Lord. And then the third time is where Jesus gets really serious. And for those of you who have ever had serious surgery, you know that sometimes that surgeon has to hurt you to deal with what's in there. And Jesus says to Peter a third time, Peter, do you really even phileo me? Peter's honest enough to say, Lord, you know all things. Peter knows he can't even really say, I phileo you. And here's, for me, when I was studying this, here's the part that just blessed my socks off. In spite of the fact that Peter couldn't even say that he phileoed him, Jesus says, feed my sheep. Isn't that great? God knows us. God loves us. And even when we deny Him, He doesn't deny us. Even when we give up on Him, He doesn't give up on us. He wants to walk with us and use us. He loves us. He know Isn't it interesting? For those of us here who have ever come to Christ and there was a moment in time where we surrendered our life to Him and we said, will you receive me as your son? Will you receive me as your daughter? I surrender my life. I know I can't save myself. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Please apply the salvation to me. Please accept me into your kingdom. Please accept me as your son, as your daughter. And God, who knows all things, sees after He receives us, all the times we would fall, all the times we would go into the dark room, all the times we would screw up, God who sees all of that says, I love you, you're my child. And here we are, His greatest failure, and He can't even say that He has a warm affection for Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, feed my sheep. Isn't that awesome? And that's the way he feels about all of us. I know some of you out there go, God can never. I can't tell you the number of people I've run into in my life ago. Yeah, you know, I used to be strong with the Lord. In fact, I think the Lord was calling me into this ministry, but I screwed up. And it's like, well, yeah, okay. But there's this thing called forgiveness and restoration and the love of God, which surpasses even our comprehension. And so I just want to say there's, there's two things that we need to do. Two things we can learn from this. One, we need to pay attention to God and what He says. Be in God's Word. Listen to Him. He will tell us the things we need to know. He'll, he'll tell us the things we need to be aware of. He'll tell us the practical things we can do so we can stay strong when we walk with Him. Don't be like a Peter who didn't listen to Him and didn't believe Him. Pay attention And I know that Peter did learn his lesson because this is from his letters. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. No longer is he going, oh no, Lord, I can handle this. He's going, I believe Jesus. I've been there. I've experienced it. I know that what Jesus said is absolutely accurate. He also said this. Let's read this out loud. Here we go. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and in His good time, He will honor you. Whose might? Not Peter's might. Not your might. Not my might. It's no longer I, but Christ living in me that gives me the power to live the life that pleases God. We need to pay attention and we need to pray. It's that simple. Because here's the thing. Even when we give up on God, he doesn't give up on us. Did you hear me? Let's say that together. Even when we give up on God, He doesn't give up on us. I hope you believe that. I hope you act on that. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank You for Your incredible grace and mercy and love. And You love all of us just as much as you love Peter. And if we know you as our Savior, if we've surrendered our life, then even if we're in a dark room, you're interceding for us. 
and you're going to restore us. So I pray for those who have been beat up in the past and have maybe felt that God can't use them anymore and God doesn't really care for them anymore. I pray that they would see today your incredible grace, even in the dark room. I pray for those who are in a dark room right now, that they would pray and they would allow you to do your work And they would believe that you have not brought them there or they have not come there to stay there, but you're going to restore them. Lord, I ask for this in Jesus' name.